let's start with classes now. Now, we've seen last time that there is such a thing called structs, but we're going to just ignore that um, and say that from now on we'll use a class for everything in C++. Now, a class defines a collection of variables just as, as the struct does it. That means um, we have a collection of variables that belong somehow together. Um, and I, this is something that we'll call attributes or data members from now on. And we have on top of that, not just the variables, like int, pool, character, arrays thereof, etc. But we also have functions that belong to this, operations or operators, in fact, also. These we call methods or member functions. Now, all of this define uh, the interface to the object of the class. It tells us what the class really is used for and what it holds. So it, it holds just a, a couple of data um, variables and it uh, will hold also the functions that belong to these variables. Now, once we have a class, this is kind of a blueprint for what we want to program. But we want to instantiate one of those classes into an object. And an object is in that case a concrete class with concrete data that is being filled in. We'll see later an example in the lecture slides about the cats. So we have, for instance, a class that is called cats. If we have a cat, this could be anything. We still need to fill in the data of this. But in that case, if we instantiate this into an object, then we can call, for instance, a variable cat uh, and give it a name, for instance, Frisky. And this is, we will then also say, a type of a cat. And that basically tells us what we can do with this particular Frisky. A bit more about that later that hopefully will make it a little bit clearer. Now, classes are a way of encapsulating data that belongs together. And that means also that we can hide things that are not that important towards anyone that uses our classes. We bundle again, therefore, all the information that is necessary for a particular object, um, and we also bundle that with all the functionality that such an object could have. And that means that when somebody looks at that class from the outside, they often don't see what, um, how this is all implemented, but they usually see what functionality is given and what data is held there. But how this data is, um, is stored in there, whether this is an integer, a short integer, a double, all of that is often completely encapsulated and hidden towards any user. Now, declaring a class is similar to how we've seen already uh, we can use a structure in C. In this case, we don't instruct, but we use the class keywords followed by the name we use for this particular class. In this case, let's say that we use a cat as uh, the, the thing that we want to represent. And in this case, we have a cat that has two variables. Uh, one is called the age of the cat, so we call that its age, and the other one is the weight of the cat, so we call that its weight. And one of them is an unsigned integer, because unsigned makes sense, negative age uh, is a bit hard, and the same for weight. Um, although here we have a long integer, because weight could perhaps be in grams. Now a cat can not only, as does not only have these properties that it has a particular age and a particular weight for our example, but it can also speak. And therefore we also add to this particular class a function called speak, which doesn't return anything. We also saw that a function always must return something. In this case, it returns void, which means nothing. And it also does not have any parameters. It just has one function called speak. Um, so this is uh, something that we now displayed and where we see that all of this is public. Now, public means that people that want to use our class, cats, can have direct access to all these three uh, concepts of cats. So it has the two member variables, the, its age and its weight, and the one method that belongs to cats, the function speak. Now when we want to define an object, we can, for instance, say we want a number called gross weight, um, and we want this uh, to be of type unsigned long, exactly like that we can use for our own classes. We in this case define frisky as of type cat. So we have an instance, an object called Frisky, and we know that this is of a particular data type called cat. And this data type, we know already, 
because this uh, board public has a certain age, a certain weight, and we can invoke speak or we can use the, the method speak for our object frisky. So as soon as we do this in our program, we create a particular object of type cats and we call this frisky. And we know that we can use this particular function, this method that belongs to frisky, and we can attach, uh, attach or no, we can um, um, look at or set even um, its age and its weight from then on because those are two public variables that belong to this class. And we can do this with a dot operator. So we have basically our frisky, which is the name of our variable, and we can access particular data parts of frisky, such as its weight or its age, and we can, for instance, assign those or read those or print those out on the console, etc. Or we can have also the member functions, the methods that belong to frisky, and we can invoke those again by the dot operator. Now, all of you have already seen um, uh, an object-oriented programming language. This is probably very simple because this is uh, how it's done in many uh, programming languages. And we've seen already certain things. Uh, for instance, cin is basically an object of a particular class, and this has certain um, uh, functions like the dot get function with particular arguments. This is something we've already seen uh, and now should slowly become clear what is really uh, meant by C in and C out. Things we've already seen during the exercises and during some of the examples. Now you've seen that uh, uh, we've put everything as a public earlier. However, it's possible to put also some of these variables, for instance, as private and not just the variables, the, the functions. Uh, you can also make private. So we have private members of a class and we have public members of a class. And the difference is that the private members can only be accessed within the class itself. And within the class in this case means all the methods that you have to define, that you have to create and implement for that class. For instance, the speak uh, one for our class cat that you have to define what this means. So you have to there define for the function what statements are making this function up. Now within those statements, you can have access to all the private members of that class and the public members of that class. However, outside of that class, if something is private, you can't have access to this anymore. Outside of the class, you can only have access to the public members of this class. So all the code that does not belong to the class. And that's why we also use the keywords public and private, indicating that everything that follows after public or private is indeed public or private members of our class. And the defi default is private. That's why in this example over here, we had to use public straight away over here. If we had left it, then everything over here would have been private. And for instance, we would not be able, after we defined the object frisky, to say frisky its weight, because this would have been a private data member that we could not use outside um, the code of the class frisky, of uh, the class cat. Right, so if we would have done this, we could have defined the cat called boots in this cage. However, we would not be able to access its age, because by default, all of this is private. We would not be able to access also the function speak the method speak for uh, for our instance boots because again we cannot call a private methods or access private data as we've seen here. So in that case we have to really declare what is private and what is public. So in this case we have our class cat where we say our public um, functions over here and also public data um, uh, are listed first so people can see what is available to them and there is also listed whatever is private but this is not that interesting because people can't use this anyway. People can only use this when they for instance implement some of these functions within the class cat. And this is exactly what encapsulation is. Encapsulation means that some of the things are a concern of the person coding this particular class cat and that is usually things that are kept private, whereas other things are necessary for those people who code 
uh, with an instance of our class cats. In this case, people need to know everything that is public in this case. And this is called encapsulation. So some things are, uh, to the con are concerning whatever is uh, being coded inside cats, and some things are important only for those people that are coding with an object of class cats. And this also leads to accessor methods. Accessor methods is um, a particular function that immediately returns or, uh, for instance, is able to set a piece of data within the objects. And if you do this, you can completely um, make it intransparent or you can hide what value this is. So if you, for instance, have a function called getVal, which in this case you can get one of those values over here, like the 42, for instance, then get, get val can return a double, but uh, the actual uh, variable that is inside this class could be something completely different. And therefore, the way this class is implemented is something that is not to the concern of anyone using this class. It's only to the concern of the person that is creating this class. And why this is important, we will see a couple of examples later, but this is one of the core and fun was the fundamental properties of object-oriented programming. That uh, things are like the way things are implemented are completely hidden for people using those classes. For people, for instance, declaring objects of this particular class. Now, when we implement a class, we do this with a double colon operator. And in this double colon operator, we, de we declare or we implement whatever is declared earlier. So we've seen earlier that there is a class cats, and that this class has a function called speak, a member function or a method. And the way we implement now this method is by later, after defining the class like we did, um, create our, our function, just like we would create any other function, so it has a name, it could have particular arguments or parameters, it always returns something, in this case we don't return anything, we have voids, and it has between the compound statements, or it has a compound set of statements between the curly braces. Uh, in this case, it just outputs meow to the, com uh, to the console. Now, this is our entire function. The only thing that is different here is that we let it belong to the class cat. And only this way we link this particular function speak to the class cat. That means you can't just uh, call this function. No, you have to call it from within um, an object of class cat. And if we, for instance, have another function to get the age of a cat, we can do exactly that. In this case, we return something, namely an unsigned integer, and as uh, the one statement that this class uh, is implemented like, it returns the age, the hidden data from within our cat's um, class. And the same for setting, for instance, the weight of a, of a cat. In this case, we add a parameter, which is the unsigned link, uh, long weight, in this case, where we set its weight, which is the data um, uh, variable that is within the cat class, to weight. So remember here weight, or note here that weight is a local variable that only then uh, exists within this function. After we exit this function, weight is completely lost. However, here we set its weight, which is the variable that belongs to cat, uh, to weight. And therefore, this variable here that we gave to this function is then stored as the, the, the data variable of its weight of cat. Okay, now let's go for a quiz to see if uh, you really understand what we just said. Now, can one cat access another cat's age member? So if we, for instance, say we have a piece of code over here, so we have a particular um, uh, function called quiz that also belongs to cat, and in this particular function, we create an object called kitten of type cat. And we set that uh, the kitten's age is zero, with its, a its age being a member, a private member of class, class cat. Would that allow us to access this uh, particular data? Yes or no? And the only way to find this out is by trying this code out yourself um, on our server because I'm not going to reveal here the answer. 
right? So let's revisit what we've seen about structures. A struct is basically something that we can, uh, where we can group different types of variables together. They don't have to be all of the same type like here, but you can have different types of variables. And we group them inside a structure. A class is exactly the same as a structure. However, a class also has the possibility to make some of those members private, not public, so that you can always uh, access this, for instance, by saying complex.re or complex.im. If those are private, then outside, uh, on, in the main function, for instance, you cannot access these particular members of a class. And this is only possible because to that class, there is not just data here, there are not just variables, there are also functions that belong to this class. So methods that can also in the class be added. So a struct is like a very, very simplistic class. Now, before we go to a special type of function, which is the constructor and also the least structure that belongs there, let's first see why sometimes grouping data is uh, making sense. And for that, we're going to continue writing our line function. So note that up until now, we've been programming in usually the main function. Sometimes we've encapsulated some of that part of the main function into a separate function. But after a while, this gets really complex and almost unreadable. Now, imagine that instead of drawing a line like we've been doing it up until now, we want to draw a nicer line with some colors, uh, both for the foreground and the background. So in that case, we want to not just uh, draw something on the line, but also uh, start using color. And this is the function to do that within um, NCURSES. And for color, we've seen that we need to init color pairs for foreground and background, and those start at 1, with 0 being the default of the console, but 1 is where we uh, look then at different types of colors. So we, for instance, can say 1 is uh, with a, a foreground red, background blue, for instance. We'll just type 3 of those with any color that we can think of. So. Here, we, for instance, we have a, a green background with a black or with a white uh, background and a green foreground. And here we have, for instance, a yellow foreground with a green black background. So these are different types of colors that we could choose from. And instead of saying we want our line to be filled with just the positions, we also want the line to be in different types of colors. So for our line, in that case, we don't want to define our line as having particular positions um, that we fill right over here, but we want to also have a particular color for exactly the data point that we want to have. And also that is something that we need to fill in. We can also use a short for this one. So it's basically a very short number, either one, two, or, whoops, in this case, three, for instance. Um, and in that case, we say, for instance, um, color is our color pattern. Also, this is of size columns because we want to create a different color, perhaps, for each point in our line. And also there, we're going to use a very similar construct as we have over here for the data points, except that we, for instance, start with um, color one, and after a while, we use exactly the, the same, except that, well, actually we don't need the color one over here, we can just uh, use this randomly even. So instead of saying the color that we define for uh, the height uh, position, there we go, is just purely random. So it goes between, um, in this case, if we have it like this, 0, 1, or 2. This is what we give um, to our colors. We could, for instance, add a couple more colors or a few less, but I think this should be doing it. So in this case, um, we have here um, values that are 0, 1, or 2. We can add another one, for instance. There we go. And then we can add another color pair, where we, for instance, have the foreground blue, and the background 
Uh, let's make that green. There we go. So we have now four different types of color pairs. Just be careful with copy pasting. And we want now our line to be a little bit color, more colorful. Right, so. And then finally, I also want a background color to be explicitly um, called, where we have, for instance, color blue and then color black. So it's rather black as a background um, for our background color. Right, so instead of just drawing parts of the line now, we can, um, with our attributes, uh, look at what is going on there. And we've seen already in the past that with at on, we basically can uh, change the color attributes for whatever we're going to print next. So in this case, when we print uh, this position of the line, we're also at... Um, uh, at i, we're also going to give the color. So we say basically this is the i color that we're going to set here. If, however, we're not going to do anything, then we're going to say, um, actually it should be in its pair, and then our color. And since our color always has to start at 1, we have to add 1. Since our color could be 0, 1, 2, or 3, we basically want here a value of 1, 2, 3, or 4 for our color. And here in this case, we do exactly the same, where we will have um, color 5 that we want to add here. There we go. So we, in this case, draw the line with its particular color that we already define over here by a random value, of course. So once we see whether that works, oops, we made a problem. Oh, in its pair is wrong. I am going to think it is color pair most likely. That would probably make more sense. See here, I don't remember anymore what the right uh, function was called, but here, there we go. Now we have a line that has a little bit more variety and color and that is perhaps nicer to look at. The question, however, here is when we have this for our line, we want our line to be of uh, a certain shape. This is what we define over here, the squiggliness of this line, and here we have a certain variation colors. All of this belongs together as a line, and this is where classes come in. I mean, in this case, we can start with a structure where we combine uh, the line uh, positions over here together with the colors. But with classes, we can group those together, and that's what we're going to do now. We're going to basically first start a class that we call line um, and we're going to define in this class first everything public. This is like in our first example where we, everything is basically a data type, this data that we want to group together. We could have done this with a structure but we're going to expand it later into a class with proper functionality and encapsulation. Now. When we define our line over here, it has a certain position, so we can call this position. We need a type for this, so this is again our short integers, and this is an array. Now in this case, our array should have a particular maximum size, so let's call this 200 for instance. And at the same time, we have not just an array of the positions, but we also have an array of colors. So also there we use 200. In this case, 200 is not a nice, elegant solution, but it will do for now, because our screen will never be larger than 200 um, characters in the horizontal span. Right, so then this class over here is basically going to define um, two things that are together, the position and the color of a particular line. So instead of now defining all of this here 
And whenever we program afterwards, we have to think that a line and color needs to belong together. We can basically say we're going to start a line of class line. And for line, this is already available to us. Um, of course, it's the size uh, 200 and it's called position rather than line, but we can completely delete this and do exactly what we had before. So now we have to access the data member of line, which is called position. And we look at the first position, so that's position zero. And we say that this is lines divided by two as we had before. Now for all the others, we look at the position in exactly the same way as we had it before. So the line of position i is then becoming the, uh, the same as the line at position i minus 1 plus this random uh, thing that we add to this. This is this, still the same. And we do this until columns, and we hope that our columns uh, is lower than the 200 that we defined there. The same for colors. Um, and in that case, we can do exactly the same in one loop, of course. So we can get rid of this, and then this over here, we can copy right here, where we say the line color at position i equals this particular random number. And this is much easier. You basically create a line, which is an object of type line, and this line position we define as a certain way, and this line color we decide, uh, decide as a certain way. And it's the only thing that we haven't done yet is define the color for the first character, as we see here. So here we can just start, for instance, um, let's start with two. Right. Now, for the remainder, we have to now use our line class instead of just the raw data variables that we've had. So in that case, we can say here, the line.position position at i uh, we look at, and then we use the line.color at exactly that, um, at that position. And everything else, is more or less the same now. So basically, the only thing that has uh, changed is that we changed here now position and color as belonging together to the same class or to the same object line of the same class line with a capital L. Now let's see where this works. All right. And we execute this and we have our color for line. So also here, we can increase the screen a little bit to get a better view of what, what this does. It creates a squiggly line where the position of the line changes according to this random function we saw earlier, but also the color changes. And the whole data that is necessary to, to draw this line is now into this one class, which has a particular position and a particular color.